Amen. Thank you, Jerry. The Bible says, sing unto me a new song. We got a couple of them today. So, uh, man, we are ending our series in the seven churches, uh, the seven letters to the seven churches. Have you enjoyed the study or the kind of look at, at Revelation as we've went through it, at least the seven churches, and hopefully we've learned something in the process. Well, we're coming to this final church, and uh, Jesus doesn't have anything good to say about it. <laughs> But, you know, he doesn't have anything to say good about it, but it isn't necessarily that he doesn't have anything bad to say about it. He just doesn't have anything good to say about it. This church is neither hot nor cold. It's neither on fire. It's neither stelled out. They're, they're just doing church. They're showing up every Sunday and just doing church. <sighs> there have been times in my life that I've showed up on Sunday and I'm just doing church. I'm neither hot nor cold. I'm neither expecting or wanting or thinking that anything will happen. I'm just, it's Sunday, let's go to church. I think there's periods where we all go through times like that, isn't it? Especially when we lose hours of sleep. Um, but but there, are, there are times where, where we're, we're, we're just like this church. There's many churches in America, I would say fit right into this, that every Sunday they show up, not expecting God to show up, not expecting God to do anything miraculous, just kind of, we're church, we're here. The history of Laodicea is uh, quite a history. Um, this is a wealthy place, it's a place of prominence, a place of industry, a place that that uh, was on the the intersection of four major trade routes. And they were known for, for their wealth. They were known for their uh, black. They had, they had sheep there, and the, it produced this black wool that was sought after. The Romans used it for their undergarments. It was expensive, and they were, they were known about that. They were also a finance center uh, for the area. And... Uh, they had a big place of comments. L ladies, if you'd like to go shopping, um, you would probably, well, there's a few gentlemen that would like to go shopping too. I understand. But this would be where you go. This is where you get your pots and pans. This is where you get your, your goods. It was, it was this commerce center. They were not only known for that, they had a medical clinic there. And this medical clinic was known throughout the known land for their eye care. They had produced a salve that they would put on the eyes that would help heal the eyes. So this was, this was a place where people would go to, would look forward to going to. But they were also known for something else. They had nasty water. I've lived in Texas. <laughs> I remember at Fort Hood, man, uh, all around Colleen, you would get the, oh man, it was the nastiest water that I had ever tasted. I mean, you, you, it smelled bad. Well, this, the Laodicea, about five miles north, they had a spring that was cold water. And they would pipe it in. The, the Romans had built these aqueducts, and it would come in. And by the time it got to them, it was lukewarm. And then about eight miles south, there was hot springs. And the water would come up from the south. And by the time it got to them, it was no longer hot. It was just warm. Y'all like to drink warm water? And not only that, it was full of mineral content. So that even made it nastier. It tastes bad. It smelled bad. They had everything but good water. <laughs> and this was, the, this was Laodicea. By the way, it was named, uh, the church was named after um, the founder, Antopoclus. Anyway, his, his uh, wife was named Laodicea. And that's how it's got its name, Laodicea. So it was named after his wife. So that's a good thing. I mean, if you want to, if you want to get on good terms with your wife, just name a city after her. You know that. That's a pretty good gift. Um, but here's this church, and much like the churches that we've spoken about of the other six, the church took on a lot of the characteristics of the city. 
and they were complacent. They could do it on their own. They didn't really, they didn't really need Jesus. They didn't really need the Holy Spirit. They were comfortable, complacent. And Jesus says, you know what I think about a church that's comfortable and complacent? I want to spew you out of my mouth. I want to spit you out of my mouth. Or the actual term, the New King James gets it best. I want to vomit. Ooh. We don't, that's why nobody else uses it. Because <laughs> that gives us the images. If any of you have ever had a three-year-old, you know all about that. Um, and he's got this. He says, I, I just, I have no use for a complacent church. I would rather you be uh, poor, cold. I'd rather, I'd rather you, you have nothing and search for something. Or I'd rather you be on fire. What I don't want you to do is just show up and have nothing. Where, where the spirit isn't moving, where you're not impacting the community. So we're going to go in Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22. We're going to take a verse at a time and kind of step through it. So we'll begin with verse 14. And he says this, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. The Amen. We say that, right? End of prayer. Amen. Time to eat. That's how we know. As soon as the food's there, it's hot, right? My, my kids said, Dad, don't do any preacher prayers. Not, not when we're eating. Let's just keep it simple. You know, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Time to eat. Sometimes whenever you hear something that you really like, you say amen. Not often, but it happens. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sometimes we just... It, it, we just Say it where we, we feel the presence of God and we just want to make, amen. It simply means let it be. Let it be. Let it be. It also can mean um, it is true. It can also mean um, it is finished. Let it be. Next thing he says, the true and faithful witness. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the true. And faithful witness. Right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. One of the verses we, we all have memorized or should have memorized. And like I said before, the, Jesus is the true and the faithful. He is the one. It's, it doesn't matter what we think, really. <laughs> it matters what God thinks. He is the faithful witness. And he showed up. He died for us as a witness to us. It's sad in America. Churches are closing their doors. But I don't think any church should close its doors. I've said that before. I believe that every, every church could get its vision, its, its impact on a society, on, a, on where God has placed it back. But they need to go back to the true and the faithful witness who said to us, you be a witness. That was our commandment by God. You be my witness to a world that desperately needs you. I've given you the truth, right? We have that, the Bible. He said, now go be a witness to all those who need to hear about the truth. We need to realize that it's not our way. We say that at the end of the service. Not our way, Christ's way, right? But it really is Christ's way. It really is not our way. He is a ruler, so he is a sustainer of all creation. In him and through him was all things made that was made. Right? John 1. Jesus is the source of all good things. All wealth, all satisfaction, all power, all glory. He is the magnificent significance of life, of all joy, peace, passion, that's the conclusion, right? Whenever Solomon gets through all of his stuff, we've been studying the book of Ecclesiastes, and, and Solomon gets to it and he says, all this stuff is meaningless except God and how you serve him and what you do for him. That's where meaning comes. Everything else is just chasing after the wind. I think 
in verse 15, he says, I know your works. Some Bibles say your deeds. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm, I will spew, spit, vomit you out of my mouth. King James got it right. Makes me sick. That's what he's saying. I did not put this church here to show up and not expect anything. And because you're just showing up, I just want to spit you out of my mouth. You're not doing what, what I require you to do. You have no passion. You have no desire. You're not making a difference in your cities and your towns. You're not even making a difference in your families. Therefore, Jesus says, you make me sick. And that's not what Jesus died for. Jesus died so that he could reach the world, so that he could provide a way, so that all of us could live forever with him. A lukewarm church exists without purpose. It gathers without passion. And it meets without effect. Say that again, because it's really good. You can write this down. A lukewarm church exists without purpose. It gathers without passion, and it meets without effect. A lukewarm church means it's just half committed. And Jesus doesn't want a church that's half committed. He wants us all in, 100%. You have no purpose, you have, you, or you have lost your purpose. The, the purpose of the church is not so that you can gather here on Sundays, sing songs, study about Scripture, have fellowship, friendships, and do nothing when we leave. That was never the purpose of the church. Is it a part of the church? Absolutely. Is it essential for the church? You bet. I hope that, that we enjoy one another, that we come together, that we're learning together, that, that we enjoy fellowshipping with one another, that we feel part of a family, but that's not the purpose. It's part of it, but that's not the whole purpose. Jesus says, now take that into the world and go and make disciples. Go and make people come to a realization that I died for them. Jesus called the church his bride. He's going to come back for his bride, his church. He loves his church. Jesus established his church. And he established it so that we could share his love with the world. To care for orphans, the widows, the poor, to clothe the naked, to care for the dying, the sick, and those in need. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the uttermost ends of the world. It's not wrong to have fellowship, friendships, and to worship God with all of our heart. Matter of fact, we should do that, right? I would hope when you come in, you expect to worship God. You're expecting God to to show up. You you said, God, come on in. I want to fill your spirit. I I hope that's why we come. But if we don't take it beyond these walls... We're not fulfilling the purpose that God put us here for and put this church here. The church should have a passion, a passion to make a difference, a passion to see others come to know Christ, a passion to show love to the fellow man, a passion to worship God with our full heart, a passion to see our children come to know Christ, a passion to come alongside the hurting, a passion to go wherever he leads it's not just a song the church is God's it's God's showing the world this is my family and I want you to be a part of my family we're supposed to be different the world's supposed to look at us and say wow I don't know what's up with them but they're they're different than everybody else and not in a bad way they're they they seem to have this peace that passes all understanding, right? Amen. But it's not just the church. It's us as individuals. We need to ask ourselves, are we having an effect on the people around us? Are we having an effect on our family? And I'm talking a positive effect. You're having an effect. The world is having an effect. 
on people. Trust me, so media is having an effect on people. You don't believe that? Just we're getting ready to, to go into the political. So, well, we're actually in it. Trust me, the world is having an effect on people. We see it everywhere around us. But are we as Christians? Now, this may surprise you. Please hold your seats. But God is not a Republican or a Democrat. He don't care. <laughs> he cares about his son. He cares about our mission to go and spread the gospel to the world. I guarantee you, the world is having an effect on everybody you love. We need to have that same effect on them. I wonder, if, if God chose to spew Christ's way out of his mouth, would anybody know? Would anybody notice? Like, if we close our doors tomorrow, would, would this community even know that we, other, other than the people that are here, would they, would they know that we closed our doors? I mean, that's what we really need to ask ourselves, because God says they, they better know. If you're making an impact on the world, there should be a void there, right? I can tell you there's probably 600-plus kids that ain't getting the third day program that would know. I, I, I will tell you our friends that were here uh, last week and sang for us, and uh, the church goes out there and ministers. They would know. They're like, where's our friends? Where's the people who come to us like when no one else will? I guarantee you that um, the missions that we support, they, they probably know this. Um, I think... Those each week that come in this place that you don't even know about, that we spend hours counseling and sharing and trying to help them through difficult times, I hope they'll notice. I think those that come on Wednesday night to the NA program that really has nothing to do with us other than us opening up our church to them and saying, we have a place for you to come, I think they would notice. I think... Maybe the women on, on Thursday nights, they would notice. Maybe the life groups and the, the home groups, the, you know, they would notice. So uh, we have an impact. But how far does that go? How, how far do we reach? Are we really changing our community around us? Or is our community changing us? You know, the Bible says to be transformed, Right? Not, do not conform. Do not be like the world, but be different, right? By renewing of our mind, by, by studying Scripture, by knowing what that is. Verse 17 says this, For you say that I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. It's not very nice. It says you are rich. The church of Lucida was, was devastated by earthquake in A.D. 60. Nero offered to rebuild the, the, the entire city. You know what the city said? Nah, we got it. We're fine. We'll rebuild it ourselves. We are absolutely self-sufficient. You can take your money somewhere else. We're okay. The church in Laodicea and Sardis are the only churches that, re that received negative criticism, only negative criticism, What's interesting about them is they're both wealthy, comfortable, and self-sufficient. Jesus could have easily been talking about America, can he? I mean, honestly, think about this. 30.8% 30, 30 of the world's wealth is right here. Add to it Europe's wealth at 23%, and you're up to 53% of the world's entire wealth is in Europe and America. Over half the world's wealth is right here. Guess where the two places the church is dying? Europe and America. It's amazing to me whenever I think about that. Uh, and I thought uh, the average income in America, I looked this up, $60,575. That's the average income for a family in America. The median income is 56420 And I know some of you are saying, I need another job. <laughs> like, I need to talk to my boss. <laughs> but 
to put it kind of in perspective, on the April 14th, Isaac is going to come. He's going to talk about his country, Kenya. Kenya, where the average salary is $2,170 a year. The living wage is about $340 a month, which means, I'm sorry, $2,170 a month. And average, the average, a year, yeah, uh, $340 a month, which means the average salary or the living wage is 50% less than what it takes to live in the country. Man, we are rich. The rich have prospered. And they need nothing. Jesus could very well be talking about America. Then he says, you are wretched, literally, that you would be afflicted spiritually. They had money, they had programs, they had staff, they had what they needed, but yet they were not dependent upon God. And he says, because of this, you are wretched. He then says, you are pitiful. Alenius, it means despicable would be a better translation. You are despicable. And not despicable me. Despicable. <laughs> they, they had all they needed, so they were just doing things in their own strength, but they were missing the power of Jesus. How many churches are like that? We're doing things in our own strength. We're not relying on the power of Christ. I guarantee you, you go to some of these third world countries, you go to the churches that are meeting in basements in China, you go over to Iran where, where it's illegal, but yet the churches, I, I guarantee you, they're not missing the power of the Spirit of God. They are reliant. They are putting their lives on the line to worship. Next, he says they were poor. Not money, but it's spiritually poor. Blind. Probably pointing them back to the thing they bragged about most. We are the eye center capital of the world. We've got solved that people sought, sought after all over the known empire. He said, what about your church? Okay, you got this medical facility. It's great. What about your church? Is people all over the world wanting to be like you? To serve the same Savior you serve? You're known for other things, but what about you, the church? They had a great reputation, but the church was not making the same impact. They could only see like blind people their own nakedness. And that's why he uses that next. Probably alluding to the fine wool, that black wool I talked about that was produced in the area. They didn't need anything outwardly. They were okay. They look good, but they're not making a difference. After Jesus points out our problem, he then points to himself as the solution. Isn't that great? God didn't say, this is your problem. Good luck. You need to change. He says, let me tell you what the solution is. The solution is me. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus points out their wealth, their self-sufficiency. He, he talks about their industry. He talks about what made them wealthy. He says, this is not what you need to seek. You don't need to seek the things that you are. You need to seek me in the midst of this and you need to make an impact in your community. Gold represents wealth. White garments represented purity. Uh, and Sov represented I, that this medical stuff that you're talking about, that, that you're so zealous about, that you tell the world about, that has made you famous. You need to rely on me to make you famous. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. He's reminding them that even when this rebuke is coming upon them, I still love you. Repent, turn, come back to me. You have such. I have blessed you. I've given you a blessing. I've given you a, a beautiful place to live, a, a way to take care of your family. But come back to me. 
Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Holman Hunt's famous painting, The Light of the World, shows Jesus standing at the door knocking. And you'll remember that if you've seen it. But there's no handle on the door. Jesus is knocking on the door. If you look at the painting, there's no handle. There's no way to open the door. The only one who can open the door and say, Jesus, come in and worship with us and dine with us is us that's inside saying, Jesus, come in. Come in. We want you in here. As I mentioned before, this, this passage is really not about salvation, although it can talk Jesus wants to come into your heart. That's absolutely true. But it's about the church. It's about the church. I stand at the door and I knock. Will you open it up? Let me come in. Let me be a part of your worship. The Greek implies that he is continually knocking. That this, he didn't just knock once, you know? He didn't just do the little dun 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 see if anybody does the second thing. He is continually knocking at this door. And he says, if you hear me, meaning that it's up to us to listen to, to God speak, listen to God, knock at our, our church, knock at our hearts, to, to open the door and allow him to come in. The first sermon that I ever preached was, in, was found in the great banquet, Luke chapter 14. And it's where Jesus had invited many guests to come and, and to eat with him. And one by one, they began to make excuses. And Jesus says, go out to the, the highways and the hedges. First he says, go to the blind, the crippled, the lame. Bring them in. And the servants go out. They bring them all in. And they're all there. And he says, but there's still room. He says, go out to the highway and the hedges and bring them in so that my house may be full. And he's talking to us. It's about the great banquet that is going to occur in heaven whenever we're around Jesus and with God at his table. He says, there's still room. Go out to the highway and the hedges, and I love the word he uses, compel, which can literally mean drag them in. Man, that's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? Go out and drag them in so that they can hear the word of God because it's that important because if they don't, they will die. The parable, of, of course, is about us. It's about their need for a Savior and our requirement to share Christ with them. Jesus is standing at the door saying, man, I'm knocking. You got to go. You got to go. Jesus made room. There's many left. I've got houses already built. I got rooms. But they ain't full. You need to go out and find somebody to put in this one. The church should be a place where all people can find hope and a sense of purpose. And he says, be earnest and repent. Verse uh, 20, 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne. And I also conquer and sit down with my father on the throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Listen and open the door. He will come in. He will dine with us. He will set and he will prepare a place on the throne with us. We can be on the throne with God. Isn't that kind of cool? We can be in the very throne room with God, seeing Jesus, seeing the one we worship right there. Um, I thought about a story I heard uh, a long time ago, and I, I, I pulled it back. It's a little bit long, but stay with me because I think it shares. Chuck Swindoll wrote this years ago. He said, on a dangerous sea coast, notorious for shipwrecks, there was a crude little life-saving station. Actually, the station was merely a hut with only one boat. But a few devoted members kept constant watch over the turbulent sea. With the little thought for themselves, they would go day and night, tirelessly searching for those, dangerous, those in danger as well as the loss. Many lives were saved by this brave little group. On this small place. They were faithful. And they worked as a team. In and out of this life-saving station. By and by. It became a famous place. 
Some of those who had been saved, as well as others along the seacoast, wanted to become associated with this little station. They're willing to give up their time, their energy, their money in support of the objectives. New boats were purchased, new crews were trained. The station that once was obscure and a crude little uh, village, virtually insignificant, began to grow. Some of its members were unhappy that the hut was unattractive and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided. Emergency cots were replaced with lovely furniture. Rough, handmade equipment was discarded for sophisticated, classy systems that were installed. The rough, handmade equipment was, was gone. Uh, the hut, of course, had to be torn down to make room for additional equipment, furniture, systems, and appointments. By its completion, the life-saving station had become a popular gathering place, and its objective had switched. It was now used as sort of a clubhouse, an attractive building for public gathering, saving lives, feeding the hungry, strengthening the fearful, calming the disturbed, rarely occurred now. Fewer members were now interested in the brave, in braving the sea of life-saving missions, so they hired professional lifeboat boat crews to do the work. The original goal of the station wasn't altogether forgotten. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the clubhouse decorations. In fact, there was a liturgical lifeboat preserved in the room of sweet memories with soft, indirect lighting, which helped hide the layer of dust upon the once-used vessel. About the time a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the boat crew bought in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty, some terribly sick and lonely. Others were different from the majority of the club members. The beautiful new club suddenly became a messy and cluttered. A special committee saw to it that showers was installed immediately, built outside, away from the club, so victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before they come inside. At the next meeting, there was a strong words of angry feelings which resulted in a division among the members. Most of the people wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities altogether. And all the improvements were with shipwreck victims. It was too unpleasant. It was a hindrance to our social life. It's opening the doors to folks who are not our kind. As you expect, some still insisted upon saving lives, that this was their primary objective, that their only reason for existence was ministering to anyone needing help regardless of the club's beauty, size, or decoration. They were voted down and told if they wanted to save lives of various kinds of people, they would have to go down the road and have their own life-saving station. Years passed, new stations experienced the same old changes. It evolved into another clubhouse. Yet another life-saving station was built. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit the coast today, you'll find large number of exclusive, impressive clubhouses along the shoreline, owned and operated by slick professionals who have lost all involvement in saving lives. Shipwrecks still occur in the waters, but now most of the victims are not saved. Every day, they drown at sea. And so few seem to care. So few. Do we care? Every day. Every day, people die without Jesus. Every day, people will enter into eternity. And the reality of their decisions will be, and it's not just people, it's our family. It's the people that we love. Are we still a church that is a life-saving station? Or are we a church that's a clubhouse? Is our comfort more important than reaching the lost? If it is, my friends, we are Laodicea. And we are not the church that God wants us to be. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you allow us the vision that began this church to reach 
the community to be a lighthouse, a life-saving station in the midst of it, to make an impact. Lord, not just to be comfortable, not just to have what we want, but Lord, help us, help us to truly shine our light in this community. Help us to get back to life-saving, to sharing Jesus with those around. Father, we need your vision. We need your love. Be with us, guide us, and direct us into that place. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, so I'm caught in your grace, everlasting, your light will shine when morning stands, never ending, your glory. Cry of 